On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, two years after the incident, the U.S. Navy finally announces punishments for the Bonham Richard fire. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So one of my pet peeve topics I've been doing here for a long time is the fire on board Bonham Richard that took place back in July of 2020. Before I even started this channel, I did two videos on the fires as they took place, kind of an analysis of the fires. I recently did two videos, one on the response, kind of a, a time step of the fire that first day, and the second, an analysis of the fire. But now punishments had finally been doled out by the Secretary of the Navy for the incident that took place. Up to this point, the only person who'd been charged or brought to uh, accountability is a seaman recruit, an E-1, who has been charged with arson on board the vessel. Initially, he was let go because there was insufficient evidence, but since then has been brought back up on these charges. But he had been the only one who had been brought up. But now we're seeing letters of reprimand, uh, punitive judgments being doled out, including to the three-star admiral in charge of surface forces for the U.S. Navy. So let's take a look at this story. So this is Sam Legrone's story over at USNI, U.S. Naval Institute News, on this, that the Navy announces punishments for Bonham Richard fire. The Secretary of the Navy censured the former surface warfare officer boss. That's what SWO means. And just to read part of this, specifically the part that came out of the action, uh, more than were punished for the four-day fire that led to the loss of the Bonham Richard in 2020, back in July. Uh, it goes on here, the uh, commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, Samuel Paparo, included letters of reprimand and forfeitures of pay for the former commander of the Bonham Richard, Captain Gregory Thorman, and executive officer, Captain Michael Ray. There's two captains on a, on, on a large deck U.S. naval vessel. It's confusing, but uh, th that's the rank. It's not their position. Thorman was the captain of the vessel, and Ray was the second in command as well as a punitive letter of reprimand for the ship's command master chief, Jose Hernandez. Can I be clear about something? Number one, Thorman was not only retained in command of the vessel, he lost the vessel at the berth, but he remained in command up to the point of decommissioning the ship, at which point he retired from the Navy. The Navy will fire and relieve commanders for everything. There's nearly two dozen commanders of U.S. naval vessels and commands have been relieved as of this point this year, it's right around 20 or so. But this guy remained in command after losing a vessel at birth in San Diego. It is absolutely crazy for me that this is. It goes on here to say that Papano served as the Consolidated Decision Authority. In other words, usually when you do a um, court martial or, or, or a censure of some kind, it is the commanding officer of the person getting censured or reprimanded. In this case, they did a consolidate where they put all this under one banner because these people are in different commands because they were looking not just at the crew on board Bonham Richard, but the port and the, uh, the base and, and a whole batch of other commands were put in. Uh, it goes on here, uh, he served as a consolidated decision authority to oversee accountability actions following the completion of former Third Fleet Commander Vice Admiral Scott Kahn's command investigation into fire, which was released in October, which I did my two videos on. He determined the punishment in a series of Admiral's Mass December through January. This is the quote from it. The disposition uh, decisions included six non-judicial non punishments with guilty findings. In other words, there wasn't a court-martial. They just basically uh, allocated it. Two NJPs with matter of interest findings and a letter of instruction, two NJP dismissals with a warning, one additional MIF, five other LOIs. Can be clear how much the Navy loves these friggin' acronyms. It's crazy, but they do. Three non-punitive letters of caution, two letters to former sailors documenting substandard performance and six no action determinations according to the statement from the service. I want to see who exactly is given these because of their roles, uh, specifically the command duty officer, the damage control assistant, uh, who is getting this. But I, I, I'll take a little bit of fault here with Sam is he focuses almost wholly here on the fact 
that this letter is then issued uh, to uh, Admiral Brown, and this really becomes the focus here, that Admiral Brown is receiving this, and now Admiral Brown is protesting against this. Great. Ad Admiral fights are, are, are fantastic. My point here is that the main culprit in this fire is a series of issues that I don't think are being addressed here. I go to a story by uh, Megan Eckstein over in Defense News earlier this month, July 5th. She did this story. New details emerge about the 2020 Bonham Richard fire ahead of censure of three star. Now, she got an interview with Admiral Brown, and Admiral Brown is trying to set the record straight, which you know, I can kind of understand. But just a few quotes she has in here. The discombobulation in the early hours meant sailors may have missed a small window to contain the fire in the storage area. One admiral said he lacked authority to issue an order, pleaded with the ship's commanding officer to get back on the ship and fight the fire when the CO and his crew were waiting on the pier. And when that admiral, now re retired Admiral Vice Admiral uh, Rich Brown found the situation so dire, he called on another command to intervene. It refused, Brown said in an interview. Brown's very upset about this because he was never interviewed. He was never, he, he didn't see this coming, I guess. And now he has been basically uh, found uh, semi responsible for this. Uh, it goes on here and she does a great job talking about the fire that morning from the perspective of Brown, and it says right here, so Brown called the ship's commanding officer, Gregory Scott Thorman, who said that the crew had left the ship and were on the pier. The investigation in the fire noted the crew pulled out of the ship twice during firefight that morning. Thorman should have been coordinating with the base's Federal Fire Department and Southwest Regional Maintenance Center, collecting, forming the incident command team, according to the 2018 Navy instruction laying out fire prevention and fire response responsibilities for ships in maintenance goes on here. Brown said, and this is the quote from Brown, I could just tell his response that he was unsure how to coordinate the resources that were at his disposal. It was clear to me there was friction that was developing between the Navy and civilian commands. With the federal firefighters have been uh, having been pulled out of the ship multiple times and the Navy firefighters lacking the gear they needed to fully tackle the fire on their own. He then called the commander of Expeditionary Strike Group 3, a rear admiral by the name of Phil Sobeck. Phil, you can tell me to F off because I'm not in your chain of command, but you have got to get down to that pier and provide leadership and guidance because they're all sitting at the end of the pier watching the ship burn. Brown said he told Sobeck and he goes, Admiral, I'm getting my car, I'm on my way. Brown took other actions, including some outside his typical authorities as a type command. He ordered destroyers Fitzgerald and Russell to leave the pier. They shared with the Bonham Richard, even if it meant damaging the brows and cables so no other ship would suffer firefighting. Okay, time out here. This fire drives me crazy. It really does on multiple levels. Number one, the person most responsible for this is the ship's commanding officer, the executive officer, and the command duty officer who was on board the ship. The CDO was on board. He notified the captain in the XO there was a fire on board. And that command duty officer who has responsibilities as the commanding officer of the ship until relieved by the XO or the CO lost control of that fire. And again, watch my videos. They're all right up here. You can watch them. Lost control of that fire. Failed on multiple levels to put that fire out when it could have been easily controlled. And didn't use the adequate resources, just absolutely failed, failed, lost the ship. You can make the argument all you want that there was issues with the readiness of the ship. And the command report does that. This is the command report. It cites four conditions of this ship that were the key focus here. The material condition of the ship, 87% of the ship's fire stations were out of service. Great. That means 13 were operational. 13% were operational. And you should have known what 13% were operational so that you can rig fire hoses from those 13%. You should have known exactly the condition of your ship. Training and readiness. The crew had failed to meet the time standard for applying firefighting agent on the seat of the fire on 14, 14 consecutive occasions leading up to 12 July. Not 14 random, 14, the last 14 times they failed to get the wet stuff on the red stuff. And I guess that's fine. Shore establishment support, the integration of the shore base with the ship failed on a massive basis. The Southwest Regional Maintenance Center did not meet the requirements associated with fire safety and in doing so failed to communicate risk to leadership while facilitating 
unmitigated deviations from technical directives. The federal fire department didn't have adapters to connect their firefighting equipment to the ship's firefighting equipment, nor did they have provisions in place to lay fire hose from their rigs on the, on the pier, their fire engines on the pier, into the ship. They didn't even have a fire main on the ship, they were on the pier. There was nowhere to hook up to for water on the pier. They had to lay in from hydrants thousands of feet away on land, down the pier, even though you're sitting above San Diego Bay. And oh, by the way, you had two massive fire pumps right there on the pier called the Fitzgerald and the Russell, which were a never danger of fire or burning. Let me be clear about that. The, the, the Bonham Richard was not going to explode. It was not, I mean, that's not the way fire works on a ship. But one of those two ships or both of them could have provided water to the fire engines on the pier. Not only that, there was miscommunication with the San Diego and other municipal fire departments to the point that a fight broke out on the pier and they left. They left, they took their fire trucks, they took their recharging equipment, they took their big ladders and they left. It was a complete cluster. And then finally, oversight, ineffective oversight by the cognizant commanders across various organizations permitted their subordinates to take unmitigated risk in fire preparedness. A significant source of this problem was an absence of certification of the rules and responsibilities expected by each organization. Nobody knew what the hell they were doing in this fire. Nobody. There's a discussion in the fire report that the crew on board didn't know they can don firefighting gears with their uniforms because they were worried their uniforms may melt. This is the whole reason they got out of the blueberries to the new uniforms. And if that was an issue, again, take them off and put on your firefighting gear. There were multitude of incidents here. The command breakdown here was terrible, terrible. And I don't understand a couple of things, not the least of which is why it takes two years, two years to come out with this report, two years after the fire. Everybody associated on commands have rotated by this point, And the momentum here for change is now gone. It really is. This ship has been towed out of San Diego. It's down in Brownsville, Texas, being scrapped right now. The commanding officer was allowed to remain in command until he decommissioned it and retired. There was nothing, nothing done that promoted anything about learning a lesson from this fire. Because let me be clear, I think this can happen again tomorrow on board ships in San Diego, Pearl Harbor, Norfolk, Mayport, any base around the world. It doesn't appear that any lessons have been learned. And now they're going after, you know, big targets. Admiral Brown is being targeted for this. A few others, and I'm not defending Admiral Brown. I mean, everybody has culpability in this. If you're a senior commander, there is a question that has to be raised. Who put Thorman in command? If he couldn't handle it, so the guy had been the XO of the ship. And I don't buy it that the ship was coming out of a maintenance period either. It was out, it was out. And fire is the most dangerous thing that can happen on board a vessel in port. And they were just unprepared for it. The duty section wasn't ready and I don't wanna hear about it. If this had been at sea, it would never would have happened. There, no, this ship broke down in their ability to fight fire. Nobody hit the AFFF buttons, the aqueous film forming foaming button that would smother the lower V deck where the fire started to knock this out. There was, it took over an hour and a half to put water on the fire. And the first crew that did it was the San Diego Fire Department that got kicked off the pier. It, it, was, it, it was a cluster of epic, epic proportions. And the Navy sits there and louds the helicopter crews for dumping water on it. They did a great job, fantastic for them, but it should never have gotten to that point. You lost a vessel that just came out of a massive refit a capital ship of the U.S. Navy was lost at the pier. And it seems like nothing is being done about it. And two years later, on a Friday afternoon, you release the information about this report. You're taking out the trash and hoping that nobody notices. And I'm sorry, but everybody notices. Everybody who has an eye on the U.S. Navy notices this. And this is an indication that the U.S. Navy is not prepared to execute its missions. It's just not. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know what else to say about this. You can sit there and, you know, we've made a lot of uh, uh, elements here where they've talked about, you know, the damage control on Fitzgerald and McCain were great. Well, what put them in the situation to use that damage control? And by the way, 
there's a difference when you're out in the middle of the Pacific and you're saving the ship and lives are at, 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 at risk here. I mean, the crew of Bonham Richard abandoned ship. They literally abandoned the vessel. And that was one of the reasons why there was issues about going on. And let me be clear, the reason that nobody died on the ship is because the San Diego Fire Department came in and sat there and said, you're about to have a smoke explosion. We need to get everybody off. Because if they didn't make that call, I'm not sure anybody else would have made that call. And you would have had people on board when all of a sudden the air, you know, the smoke ignited on board and would have killed people. So uh, this report and the Bonham Richard fire drives me nuts. I'm sorry. It's just one of those things that the U.S. Navy has got to get their head out of their butt and take a serious look at where they are today. You know, after the, the Lexington was sunk at the Battle of Coral Sea, after the loss of Yorktown at Midway, after the SS Normandy, which became USS Lafayette, capsized at the birth in New York City in February of 1942, you had three you had major losses of vessels due to flooding and fire. The US Navy relooked at its damage control. They brought on board the FDNY, the Fire Department of New York, to talk about bringing on new firefighting equipment atomizing hoses. They increased the number of pumps on board vessels. They re-looked at the issue about firefighting versus flooding. All those issues were re-looked at because they were losing ships, had massive fires on board cruisers after the Battle of Savo Island in August of 1942. And if you go later into the war, you see ships like the Franklin, for example, which are saved, uh, where a ship like Franklin hit in 1945 would have been lost in 1942. Uh, the cruisers Canberra and Houston torpedoed off of Taiwan would have been lost if not salvage and rescue equipment been put in place to allow those vessels to be towed out. The Navy learned from this. I don't think the Navy has learned from the Bonham Richard fire. And that bodes well should the US Navy find itself in a conflict in the future. <sighs> Sorry, this, this story gets me going. I just, it's one of those ones that makes me lose my hair. Nope, too late. <sighs> if you enjoyed today's video, please subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Share it across social media, particularly to the US Navy. Leave a comment, I'm sure I'll get comments. Uh, give it a thumbs up. Hey, give it a thumbs up, why not? Why not? I'm sure some people will, I'm sure some people won't. And if you can, support the channel via either the Patreon, page, head on over to Patreon, become a patron of the channel, or hit that super thanks button and contribute to the page. That allows me to spend the time to put these videos together and to become a big, huge fan and supporter of the US Navy, because I'm sure they're not enjoying this video. But anyway, I think it needs to be said. Till our next video, Sal, signing off.